Hey, Piotrowi, it's uh, such a pleasure to be here with you on stage. I've been a big fan of vinyl for a long time. Um, Thank you, Rasmus. For those of you who uh, might not know vinyl very well, would you like to give a short introduction to yourself and the business? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, my name is Pietari, uh, and, and uh, our company is called Vainu. We're four years old, and we are uh, focusing on company data. So we want to collect as much company data uh, as possible. And now we're around 200 people, and, and uh, our ARR is uh, around 14 million at the moment. That's great. I think, from my point of view, one of the most fascinating things with your business is how fast you've scaled. In four years, you've gone to 40 million ARR, and yep. you've done it completely bootstrapped. You've been incredibly capital efficient. And I think um, one of the reasons you've been able to be so capital efficient is the way you build your customers. Could you elaborate a little bit on that, and potentially some other reasons to why you've been able to scale so quickly without an external capital? Yeah, I think our... The first idea when we uh, started off was, was that uh, the customers are our primary source of financing. And, and uh, I think the first 10 customers, they trusted us so much that uh, they were willing to sign up with us without, without seeing the actual software. Uh, so we had only promised that it will be live on August. And it actually was, so that, that, that was a cool thing. And, and, and the other, other core thing, what we have decided from the beginning, is to, that we build one year in front, uh, which, which makes us uh, get, the, uh, get the payment one, one year in advance, and, and that which we can invest further into the product and, and, and to the team. Yeah, that's really a you know, uh, cash-efficient cash way of financing your own business with your customers. Yeah. Um, why don't we start at the beginning? When was the first time you really realized that you had a product market fit? When was the first time you really realized that you know, the customer really liked what you were uh, building? <laughs> I think that the uh, really first moment was uh, when three of us as founders, Mikko Tuomas and, and, and me, uh, when, we, when we understood that we're doing sales, uh, we're doing B2B sales, and, and we don't have a good tool for finding the best possible prospects. And we, when we saw the sketch slide that this is how it could be, we realized immediately that this could be something. And, 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 and I remember the first calls we made, uh, it was, uh, I, th I think the first or the second, uh, when a person answered and I pitched my product, uh, he said, this sounds excellent, we should definitely meet. And I think it was the first five calls when we realized that, okay, this is going to be something. Hmm. Do you still have um, a lot of the, your customers that are with you from the first days? Some of those old customers, those really advocates for your product? Yeah, actually, uh, I, I think if I count the first 10, I would say maybe seven or eight of them are really our customers. Some of them um, uh, quit for a while, but then they came back, uh, which, is, which is really, really cool. And I always want to mention, mention them uh, and thank you for the trust, because it's, it's the, as I said, the only source of our success mm. is, is customers. That's interesting, actually, that you have a sort of seem to have a big part of customer resurrection, of customers that churn that then actually come back and become customers again. Yeah. Could you maybe elaborate how do you work with both upsell, which is a great fueling factor in your growth, and also yeah. on customer resurrection? Yeah, yeah. I, we've, I think that's uh, one learning from the very beginning is that we, we've always had a full focus on customer uh, customer success. And, and during, during the days we've been in the four years, uh, we've also realized that uh, customer, uh, customer happiness is not enough. We need to make customers uh, successful, and, and how we 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 work them we work them with them in, in in many many ways. We like slice the customer journey into different phases. Where there is the onboarding, uh, we focus on making sure that they understand what data driven sales and marketing means. Then there is the uh, retention phase where we make sure that they, we get delivering on the promises that they've made. And, and, and after that, uh, of course, there becomes a huge pool of opportunities where we have a specific uh, design team to make sure that they are, uh, th the opportunities are seen and approached. So I, I think the whole combo works very well for also for the customer uh, retention, uh, retention in, 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 in many ways. And the other thing that we've, uh, when it comes to customer satisfaction, it's a, it's a funny thing, and I guess that's, that's the reason why, why, why scaling up is also important to focus on the higher end of the customers, is that the, the more the customer pays, the happier they actually are, and the more they buy from us, us more. So that's another, 
other important aspect we're focusing a lot uh, going into the future and scaling up. Interesting. So you've gone from basically, you know, starting your three co-founders, I think it is, to being yep. almost 180 people right yep. now. Yep. It's going to be massive differences in how you scale your organization. You have to build in mid levels of mid layers of management. Yep. You have to build in processes, and you've actually gone from being a startup to being a yep. decently sized business. Yep. What are the you know the biggest learning from having to recruit layers of ma maybe management yep. and you know building up processes and structures internally? Yeah. I think where, where we've been very, uh, very good at is actually two things. We've um, understood that that's, that's mainly thanks to uh, Tuomas and, 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 and Mikko, is that there's a huge difference in building up the product and tech organization and building a sales uh, organization. And, and that's where we've been very, very successful, I, uh, I think, in, in understanding what kind of management is required in sales and then what kind of management is required in, in tech. Uh, and, and product, but as the company grows, then we need to build sort of a other uh, other structures as well when it comes to the HR and finance and and, and these kinds of things. And the first impression of those might be that uh, is this really uh, paying off right now? Uh, but what we, where we've been very good is uh, I think to understanding that this is something that is required for us to go beyond 100 and 150, and and uh, that's that's important mm. uh, that what we've done there. Seems like a lot of the um, early stage businesses that we meet today are struggling with hiring. Yeah. Uh, you know, engineers aren't everywhere. It's difficult to, to hire, and the competition for talent is massive. Yeah, definitely. So, how did you spend your time hiring in the early stages? Did you yeah. get in some HR person early, or how yeah. did you compete for talent? I think it's uh, in the very beginning, and that's actually uh, a cool fact that uh, uh, we we just figured out, uh, we just counted out that. Uh, out of the 25 first employees, 21 are still on the com in the company, and I, you know, really need to thank the the, the early employees uh, trusting Mikko, me, and Tuomas with the with the message and with the vision vision we told. Um, and, and I think in the very beginning, uh, to get the right team, it's about the uh, founders be able to. Uh, able to convince with the message and deliver on what is uh, what is uh, what is told. When it goes in the further, I think it, it's it's a lot about uh, the the founders' message don't matter that much. It's it's more of what the company can provide, and there comes in a very uh, good and efficient and uh, uh, like a good uh, HR organization that can build a very clear structure. And when you enter the company, what does it mean for you? And then the third thing is definitely brand, not not terms of brand in terms of like customers. Uh, that's a whole different thing. But the, uh, brand in terms of employees. So what what can we uh, provide for for tech and product and engineering departments, and what can we provide for uh, business oriented persons? And that's the third very important aspect of it. Interesting. One other thing we actually uh, discussed backstage recently is yeah. the, the impact on churn in the business. Yeah. If you're a small company, churn doesn't matter that much in, yeah. in the yeah, beginning. Okay. But yeah. once you get to scale, it's very difficult to replace uh, if you have a high churn. So how, how do you fight churn? We fight churn in, churn in, in very, very many levels. It, actually, it all starts from, uh, from marketing. Uh, uh, well, actually, to be very honest, it all starts from the first a uh, new biz approach to a, to, to a possible customer, where our, uh, where our sales pitch, it's not like, it's, it's very concrete, and it, it, it doesn't overpromise. That's, that's the first thing. Uh, and then it goes all over, as I described, from the onboarding to the, uh, the retention and, and, and to, the, to the renewals. Uh, and, and in customer success, I think one very crucial thing is also, because you can do a lot of things in customer success, it's about with data to find the right points where to attack and what to do there. And that's, we've, we've, we've done that and we're doing it more and more uh, in the future. Mm. You mentioned customer success there and uh, we talked about upsell before as well. Yeah. And um, the way the SaaS businesses do upsell vary a lot from companies to companies. Yeah. Uh, one school of thought is that you should separate the upsell from the customer success people to yeah. maintain that really relationship with the client that yeah. you're there to serve them. Yeah. And other businesses 
try to uh, essentially have the customers success people upsell them. Yeah, so yeah. How do you do and how do you think about drawing that Chinese wall between doing what's best for the customer and also yeah. uh, taking the opportunity to sell more to your existing customers? Yeah. I think it differs a lot in terms of what is the size of the customer. When it's in, 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 in an enterprise level where the uh, subscription prices are, are very significant, then there is, is very much room for specific roles when it comes to technological, when it technological implementation, where it comes to the, you know, understanding the substance of the business and when it comes to upsells. And the, lo the lower end we go, the more you can actually unite all these roles uh, into one. And, and yeah, that's actually also what we are building right uh, up right now. Interesting. Um, in terms of culture as well, you, you know, we talked a bit about hiring, but it's got to be very difficult to maintain a culture within a company uh, when you grow as quickly as you do. Because, yeah. you know, there are new levels of management, there are new people in all the time. Yeah. How do you make sure that you sort of Stay, that the culture stays the same, if yeah. that is even you know something you strive for. Yeah, yeah. I think we are. Yeah, the culture might change when we grow, but I think the DNA has always remained the same, and I, I hope it really, uh, really will. And, and I think one very crucial aspect of, of building a team, uh, a team uh, and the culture the same is that the employee uh, turnover is not high, and, and uh, that's uh, if, if the employee turnover is high, then the culture really it's hard to maintain it. And, and uh, for a reason or another, I don't know what, why, why uh, uh, but, uh, but we've been very good at, at uh, keeping people, and uh, we've been able to get very good people on board. And, and uh, I think we have a great team uh, achieving what we want. Mm. And um, also, sticking on the point of the organization, you now have offices in, is it four or five different countries? Uh, six, I believe. Six different yeah, countries, yeah. amazing. How did you think about you know, opening the third, the fourth country? How did you choose the countries to go to? How did you, you know, operationally structure yourself in a way to, so that the satellite offices could have yeah. accountability and yeah. still feel that they're a part of the overall vinyl? Yeah, yeah. yeah, I think the satellite office is a, is a challenge when, uh, when opening another office. It, there needs to be a culture that the uh, office, uh, uh, office uh, is, is feels united with, uh, with the main main office. But um, how we did is, is that uh, in this case it was me uh, with, with Joel and um, another employee. We just flew into Sweden, of course. That's the first place where you want to go uh, outside Finland uh, to set up, a, uh, set up an office. And then the second, uh, second after that was the uh, Netherlands where we flew in with, with Joel and then made sure that the, uh, uh, with, with Joel and Tele, I'm sorry, uh, to make sure that the uh, culture remains the same than it is has been uh, in in Finland and, and then gradually sort of the new people that came on board in in in, in Sweden and in in Netherlands like adopted the uh, wine way as we want to call mm. it and, and, mm. and there it went on mm. so we're having a bit of a conversational parkour here but just jumping back into the you know initial phase of the business yeah. here how did you get your first customers to really trust you when you didn't have a lot of reference cases? You know, your product was maybe an early MVP. Yeah. How did you build that trust from your first, let's say, 10, 15 customers to really you know, use your product when you didn't have a lot of references to start with? You know, I think that's a good question. I, I really, uh, you know, uh, you're just, I, I guess it's only about being able to convince and, and, and build that trust across the table uh, that that the customer gets a belief that this guy uh, is not fooling around, that they, they, are, they are serious here. And I guess that's just the feeling we were able to achieve, not only in Finland, but I, uh, we, did, we, were mani we managed to do the same thing in, 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 in other countries uh, as well. And frankly, I cannot tell you the exact answer mm. how that, that, mm. that happened. I think mm. it's just, yeah, mm. tough to say. <laughs> so where do you think uh, Vina will be in three years? Uh, we've discussed a little bit before backstage, well, of you know, your position in, in the sales process yep. and the possibility of taking a larger part of that value chain. Yep. How do you see uh, the Vina product and the Vina organization and business as a whole develop in the upcoming years? Yeah, uh, yeah I think the, um, we're focusing a lot in, in, in uh, making sure that uh, the 
uh, our data is is, is is plugged in 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 uh, of course in other solutions as well uh, in 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 the further up in the value chains in, in enterprise level uh, and also uh, on the lower end of the self serve uh, model so i believe uh, i believe what will happen that our our products and our data uh, will be served in, in many many more channels than it is now and that's that's a significant focus for uh, for us mm. Do you uh, eat your own dog food in sales? Do you use your own oh. food? <laughs> <laughs> oh, definitely, uh, definitely. In every single place we can. It, it starts from prospecting. It goes into uh, customer success. It's plugged into marketing. Uh, you name it. And, and I hope we have the results to prove that it works. Yeah, I'm sure you do. Um, so in the sales data space, it seems to me like that you have a bit of an advantage actually in building a business out of the Nordics because of the public availability to business data here. Yeah. Has that affected you in any way? Are you able to maybe use that advantage to build models to predict other data points or yeah. has that been an advantage for you in competing? Yeah, I've been talking to quite a few people around the world and, and, and very many uh, people say that if, if this kind of successful company comes from somewhere, it comes definitely from Nordics because Nordic is in a very, very fortunate position uh, that we have so much good company data available in uh, and uh, which this data can be used as a training data set to uncover more data that is not public. That could be like revenue figures, for example. They are not public information in the vast majority of the world, but with the huge data set that the Nordic provides, it can be used. So it's, a, uh, it's definitely an asset to be uh, mm. born in, in the Nordics. Mm. So looking back again into you know, the, the original days of Vino, yeah. what do you know now, or what would you tell your uh, uh, founder self in the beginning that you know now, whether that's just calming you down or you know, <laughs> giving you advice? Yeah, <laughs> that's a good, good question. I don't know, I would just say, if, you know, enjoy the moment. I guess that's the most important, more than lesson that needs to be told, uh, not that I haven't, but, uh, but I think uh, that's the number one foundation for, for future growth is to be able to enjoy where you are. Mm. Do you, um, how do you celebrate wins along the way? Oh, in, uh, in, in many ways, it starts from, uh, it starts from uh, ringing the bell in sales uh, all the way to uh, having mutual uh, like kickoffs. We, we flew, we flew in uh, people to uh, Lisbon, the whole team, and, and then the product and tech just spent some uh, good week uh, in, in, in Spain and, and in, in, in very, very, very uh, various ways and in a very everyday situations as well. So we laugh, at, laugh a lot. Mm. So we discussed a bit before on the, you know, on the broader sales and marketing technology space. And yeah. It seemed to me from an investor point of view that a lot of marketing tech businesses have grown to a certain scale and yep. then sort of flattened out, right? Mm -hmm. It's a very fragmented space in mm -hmm. general. We've seen a couple of large players like Marketo is a good example yep. too, that has become, has become quite big. Why do you think this is? And is that something you're noticing as well? Yeah, it's actually uh, something we've uh, acknowledged. There's a lot of uh, like spaces that, that are very hot or at least have been and then for some reason have, have faded away. And, and when it comes to the um, company data businesses as well, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of opportunities uh, around surrounding company data and, uh, and, and how you really uh, put the company data into product. It's, a, it's, it's not only a million dollar quest, and I think it's a, not even a billion dollar quest, and I think it's a <laughs> dozens of billions of dollars of quest. And, 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 and uh, I mean, I hope we've cracked it, uh, but nobody has yet, yet, yet been there. Mm. If you, um, I'm just imagining here, you know, you've gone from a small business to 180 employees in a very yeah. short amount of time yeah. here. Uh, how do you make sure that, you know, your employees are aligned, not just culturally, but also, you know, in the way we're moving, yeah. in the way you are selling and in the way you're building things? Yeah. How, how do you keep that, you know, alignment within a business when you're so quickly are growing? Yeah. Um, it's, yeah, I think there is not, a, you know, uh, we focus on it uh, and uh, we don't see it really as an, as an issue, but I guess it's, um, 
It's on uh, making sure that we speak with the same tone, we speak with the same message. Uh, nowadays, lately, we've, uh, of course, Slack is a very powerful tool for, for communication. And then making sure just that we are aligned with everything we do. I think that is uh, one important thing. And the other, other crucial uh, important thing for us is that we don't have that many uh, roles, like in SaaS Business General. There's a, there's a uh, product and the engineering team, then there is, uh, then there is the sales, uh, then there's customer success, and then there's marketing, and then there's uh, uh, finance and HR. That's, that's about it. So it's only five or six different role types, and it's, uh, uh, when it's not that many, then it's easy to make sure that the message flows through in mm. its, its part. Mm. Interesting. What's your favorite tool that you use in Vino, except for your own tool, obviously? Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, we use a lot of, lot of uh, uh, tools. I think uh, we use also a lot of uh, Swedish SaaS tools. So uh, I think uh, Get Accept is a very cool small tool. Then, of course, uh, we use uh, CS, CS software called uh, PlanHat. I think that's, uh, that's an excellent tool. Uh, then, of course, in the marketing, uh, we've, been, uh, implement, uh, we've been taking HubSpot into full mm. scale. Uh, so there, uh, that, that's, a, that's a great tool. Um, and then and then, then of course, um, Slack. I mean, you can't you can't, you can't ignore Slack. Uh, that's a great tool as well. Mm. So, we started out with saying, you know, your bootstrap business. Yeah. Are you in any way, you know, scared that some of your competitors might be VC backed and will be able to grow very quickly and you know uh, spend a lot of money to outgrow you? Is that is that a fear or do you feel comfortable in your situation? <laughs> Uh, I mean, of course, we look around all the time if, if there's something happening. Uh, and then, uh, given, given that the business model is exactly what we do, then definitely uh, we're very comfortable with the situation. If there is somebody, so we see ourselves disrupting the existing business. If there is somebody wanting to disrupt us in a totally new way, uh, and it would come, uh, you know, just out of the blue, mm. uh, then. Of course, we would be uh, afraid of that. But uh, up until now, we haven't seen anything. But we definitely keep our eyes open for that. Last question. Yes. What would be a 10x better product in your space? Have you ever imagined something that would significantly improve Vino or similar products? Uh, okay, come again. Uh, what would be a, you know, a 10x better product? Do you have any crazy ideas of a product <laughs> that you wanted to build that's maybe impossible to build, but that would be <laughs> 10x better? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, what we see in, in general is that, uh, you know, uh, B2B sales uh, will be more and more performed by data uh, and, 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 and made by computer. So how we see it in the future, someday down the road, uh, companies will be doing a significant part of B2B sales, just as what has happened in stock market and in programmatic sales at the moment. Thank you, Pietari. It's been a pleasure. Thank you very much, Rasmus.